So, hi. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I know it's at the end of the day and you're probably feeling very tired and everything. Um, but hopefully, by the end of this talk, you'll feel as excited as I am about UNI. So, my name is Maria. I work with UNI, uh, which is an acronym which stands for the Open Observatory of Network Interference. Uh, it's a free software project under the Tor project measuring internet censorship around the world. Now, the title of this talk may seem a little bit provocative because uh, what we're claiming here is that we can collect evidence of internet censorship. And of course, this begs the question, what is evidence to begin with? Sometimes that is quite debatable. Um, so first of all, before we get to the evidence part, censorship. Um, as you'll probably know, uh, there is a fair amount of, internet, of censorship on the internet. Um, more so in some countries, less so in others. Um, but the question is, how can we detect censorship? How, do we, how can we even know uh, whether there is censorship in a country or in a network to begin with? Um, sometimes it's not obvious that something has been censored. For example, the fact that you may not be able to access a website may not mean that it is intentionally being blocked by an ISP. Maybe you just can't access that website because it's hosted on, on an unreliable server. Or maybe the fact that you can't access a website is not because your local ISP is blocking access to it, but rather the, at the site itself is blocking you know, all IP addresses from your country. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that there are many reasons why you may not be able to access uh, various resources on the internet. And it's not always clear if these resources are intentionally being blocked, and if so, who is blocking them and why and how. So UNI is basically an attempt to answer all of these questions. The way it started was basically six years ago when some curious hackers started writing some scripts uh, trying to understand you know, how websites were blocked, um, you know, specifically was it by means of DNS and so on. And they soon realized that these scripts could actually be valuable or useful to others as well. They figured that it should not only be you know, them as you know, the skilled hackers who, can, who are in this privileged position to identify censorship, but rather this should be something that the public as a whole should be able to do. Because knowing which information is accessible and not is something that is actually of public interest, given the fact that you know, uh, we should have the right to uh, a freedom of expression and we should have the right to access information. And therefore, the question was, how can we enable everyone else on the planet to measure censorship and collect data, network data, which shows specifically who is blocking it on a resource, how they are blocking it, and so on. The why question is a bit trickier, obviously. It varies depending on the country and its laws and so on. But um, you know, knowing, for starters, what has been blocked is a decisive first step. And so these hackers back in 2011 uh, decided to uh, you know, improve upon these tests, uh, develop different types of tests depending on what they wanted to measure. And then they also started you know, um, writing software for, uh, for a collector to collect measurements, for a bouncer and so on. They basically started architecting an entire software system which would enable people from all, all corners of the planet to measure censorship locally in their networks, send that data back to UNI servers where UNI then would publish the data so that in, in order to increase transparency of internet censorship. And so UNI was born five years ago. Um, and so the, 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 the main thing that, that UNI aims to achieve is basically to empower decentralized efforts around the world in increasing transparency of internet censorship. While this might, may sound like fluff, this is actually something that we want to practically achieve and is being achieved every day, every single day that someone runs Uniprobe, uh, the software around the world. Uh, since 2012, millions of network measurements have been collected by UNI's global community around the world. Uh, this is a volunteer-driven uh, volunteer uh, project, a community-driven project, in the sense that uh, the software is open, the data is open, the methodologies are open, um, and they are being reviewed by the community on an ongoing basis. Uh, and every time someone runs the software, runs a test uh, somewhere in the world, the data will get, will get published, and that's how we know what is happening censorship-wise around the planet. So what exactly does UNI measure? 
So as mentioned, uh, Uni software is called Uniprobe. Um, it has a lot of different types of tests, which can basically measure various aspects of internet censorship. But some of the core tests are, are designed to measure uh, these specific things. First of all, uh, the blocking of websites. Um, so we have a variety of tests uh, which have been integrated into a core test called web connectivity, which is designed to measure whether uh, a website has been blocked by means of DNS tampering, HTTP blocking, or TCP IP blocking. Um, we also have other tests which are designed to measure whether instant messaging apps are blocked. So specifically, we have tests for WhatsApp, uh, for Facebook Messenger, and for Telegram. Uh, the reason why we chose these specific apps was because A, they're used by a lot of people around the world, and therefore they're, uh, they, they are of more interest, but also because uh, we have received requests for these tests by community members. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that if you think we should be testing other apps as well, please let us know and we'll be happy to work on developing tests for them. Uh, these tests specifically uh, measure the reachability of the apps from local vantage points. Uh, then uh, we have other tests which are designed to uh, examine whether middle boxes are present in a network. Uh, by middle boxes, we mean various systems which, on the one hand, they could be used uh, potentially for the purposes of implementing internet censorship or surveillance. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there's a lot of middle boxes used in networks for legitimate networking purposes, such as cache loading. So it's not necessarily the case that because you have found a middle box in network, that, that middle box, you know, is bad or used for evil purposes. But the first step is identifying what is in your network. Uh, and once you have identified it, then the question is, okay, now we've found this middle box, now let's try and understand what is also being blocked in this network, whether that is apps, whether that is websites, and so on. And, you know, it's, we're trying to put various pieces of the puzzle together to identify, you know, who's blocking what and how and so on. To circumvent censorship, uh, a lot of us probably use various circumvention tools. Um, like web proxies, but also other tools like, like Tor, Siphon, uh, Lantern, and so on. And then the question is, great, or not so great. We found censorship in the network. Can we circumvent the censorship? Which tools work? To this end, we have developed other tests which are designed to examine whether uh, popular circumvention tools are blocked in a network or not. And the reason for this is because that way you can know which tools to use to circumvent the censorship. Um, currently, we have tests for, for Tor, so we have a reachability test uh, connecting to the, to see if you're able to connect to the Tor network from your local vantage point. We also have tests uh, measuring the reachability of uh, Tor bridges um, and uh, other bridges like Meek. Um, and we also have some tests for uh, Siphon, Lantern, and OpenVPN. Finally, and more recently, uh, we've also integrated some tests which are designed to measure the speed and performance of networks. Uh, one of these tests is called NDT. Uh, the other one is called Dash. Uh, Dash is designed to measure uh, video streaming performance. And the exciting thing about these tests is basically that, um, well, in addition to measuring the speed and performance of your network, which in itself is very useful, uh, the data that's collected from these tests can also potentially be used to examine more subtle forms of censorship, such as throttling. So, as I mentioned, these tests have been run, uh, have been run, and are being run by tens of thousands of people around the world every day. Um, the the data has been collected from more than 200 countries. So, I don't think. Um, I have time or am able to talk about the 200 countries around the world. So I've only uh, selected a few case studies, if you will, um, from uh, our recent uh, research. I'm gonna start off with Iran, which kind of feels like a cliche because a lot of people in the censorship measurement world like to focus on Iran. Um, but the reason why I'm starting off with Iran is actually because uh, I found it the most fascinating research-wise because we found the most censorship in, in there in comparison to other countries by far. Of course, our research has its limitations, but uh, we've, we were able to confirm the blocking of, of more than 2,000 URLs uh, in, in Iran. Um, and actually, censorship in the country appears to be very pervasive because we saw that many different types of websites were found to be blocked. Often it is the case that in various countries you will find, so for example in Europe, um, often you will see that 
uh, gambling sites are blocked. And the, the reason for that is because, say, gambling is illegal or torrent websites, things like that, right? Or maybe in countries where pornography is illegal, you'll see that pornography is blocked. Um, but in Iran, what we see is that a lot of different types of websites, um, some of which the, the blocking of which can be legally justified, but in other cases where it's not really clear what the legal justification is, uh, we also see those forms, those types of websites to be blocked. So within, so specifically, uh, we see that major platforms like Twitter, Facebook, uh, and even some uh, search terms on Google were blocked in Iran. Um, but we also see uh, other types of sites and services that you may not necessarily notice to be blocked as well. For example, we found, um, we found multiple Kurdish websites uh, to be blocked in Iran. This, I think, was quite interesting because it shows basically that politics influence decisions around censorship. And while many of us can say, yeah, obviously politics influence censorship, it's different to assume that and it's different to have data which actually, you know, proves that Iran is blocking Kurdish websites. Uh, this implies that, you know, geopolitics, that they may be attempting to reinforce uh, geopolitical dynamics of power, hence the motivation to block specifically a wide range of Kurdish websites. Um, and the reason why I'm stressing the term, uh, why I'm saying wide range, is because it's not like it was only Kurdish sites that were, uh, you know, expressing criticism towards the government, but it was also Kurdish news websites and human rights sites and so on. Um, there are many other cases where we see the role of politics in the censorship implemented in Iran. Um, so, for example, we notice that a lot of U.S. sites are blocked, a lot of Israeli sites are blocked, uh, regardless of their content. Um, but we also see, interestingly enough, that some sites are blocked in Iran, not by Iranian ISPs, uh, but by the sites themselves. Um, so, for example, Norton uh, is not accessible in Iran, and the reason for this is not because Iranian ISPs are blocking the uh, antivirus software uh, site, but because the site itself uh, has to comply with U.S. export laws, um, which basically translates into that they, they are, they are uh, forced to prevent Iranians from accessing their resource. Uh, similarly, we see that other services that use Google App Engine uh, are also blocked in Iran, not by Iranian ISPs, but by the services themselves, again, in compliance with uh, U.S. exports uh, laws and regulations. Another interesting thing about uh, censorship in Iran is that it appears to be quite centralized because we noticed that the same sites were blocked by all of the ISPs uh, where tests were run throughout the duration, throughout a scope of three years. Um, so what you see here in this graph is basically uh, based on our data analysis, based on our uh, key findings, having analyzed thousands of measurements uh, collected over the span of three, of three years. And what we see here again is that since all of these ISPs, uh, which I think if I recall correctly were 60 different ASNs, they, they're all blocking them in the same way. And this implies a centralized infrastructure for censorship. Another uh, even more interesting thing, interesting in my opinion at least, is that censorship in Iran does, appears to be non-deterministic. By this what we mean is that they're not always blocking a specific site. You will see that uh, ISPs will flip between blocking and unblocking sites. Um, so for example, you will see in the measurements that within a month, for example, most of the times they will be blocking a resource, but sometimes they will lift the blocks and then block it again, or the other way around. Um, it's not entirely clear why, why they are doing this, but having looked at data throughout three years, it is clear that they are doing this. Uh, it may potentially be the case that they are doing this as a way of making the censorship more subtle, uh, so, so that you know, it's not necessarily obvious to you that something actually is indeed being blocked. Um, and finally, another thing is that um, when, when, the, when the testing started back in 2014, it looked like uh, Iran was, was using what we call smart filters, uh, which is not actually that smart, but what we mean by smart filters was that instead of blocking access to an entire domain, they were selectively only blocking specific web pages um, hosted on HTTP. So for example, uh, instead of blocking access to Instagram, the, the entire service, they were only blocking access to specific web pages uh, on Instagram. Um, however, 
Over the last few years, a lot of services have implemented HTTPS by default, uh, including Instagram, which means that now they can't you know, apply these smart filters, they can't limit their censorship to specific web pages. Um, and so what we see now is that they're blocking access to the HTTPS version as well, rendering entire sites and services inaccessible. So this uh, indicates a sort of transition from uh, smart targeted censorship to blanket censorship. Um, and finally, and finally um, we also see that when we say that censorship in, um, in Iran is, is, is sophisticated, it's also because in addition to blocking a wide range of sites and services, uh, they're also kind of cementing their censorship by blocking a wide range of circumvention tools as well. So what I mean by this is that, sure, you cannot access a lot of content on the internet, but you can't really circumvent the censorship that easily either. Um, in addition to a wide range of web proxies, they're also blocking a very popular circumvention tools like Tor, for example. We found the Tor network to be blocked in most uh, networks. On a positive note, though, um, Tor bridges uh, worked in most cases, uh, which means that in theory, Iranians could uh, circumvent the censorship by using Tor bridges to access the Tor network. Uh, in Pakistan, um, <clears throat> which was another site that we did, again, looking at network measurements collected over the last three years, uh, we see that they're, they, they're using what we call smart filters, so selectively uh, only blocking sites, uh, uh, specific uh, web pages hosted on HTTP. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is that uh, they are not blocking uh, sites on HTTPS. So, for example, when uh, three years ago, they started blocking a wide range of content that had to do with the, the Draw Muhammad Day uh, campaign. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this or heard of it, no. Anyway, it was a very, very controversial campaign um, which basically expressed uh, religious criticism towards Islam. And uh, yeah, this, uh, this in Pakistan is considered blasphemy and is being prosecuted under uh, Iran, uh, sorry, Pakistan's uh, laws against blasphemy. And so back then, uh, they blocked, uh, instead of blocking access to uh, the whole of YouTube or the whole of Reddit or whatnot, they only limited their censorship to the specific pages of YouTube and so on um, that were on HTTP. But now that they're on HTTPS, uh, you know, those specific web pages that, that, that are technically banned are accessible uh, over HTTPS. Um, we also see in, in Pakistan, quite similarly to Iran, that um, a, lot, a lot of websites uh, run by ethnic minorities uh, are being blocked as well. Uh, in Iran, we saw that sites run by the, Kur by the Kurds were blocked. Uh, in Pakistan, what we're seeing is that uh, websites uh, run by the Baloch and the Hazara ethnic minorities are blocked there as well. Again, indicating that potentially the motivation behind the censorship uh, is to reinforce certain geopolitical dynamics of power. In Indonesia, um, again, we were able to confirm the blocking of more than 160 websites. Um, the interesting thing in Indonesia was that we found Vimeo and Reddit to be blocked, but apparently their ban was lifted more than two years ago. And even though their ban was technically lifted more than two years ago, they're still blocked in Indonesia, according to the data that we're collecting. Um, the reason why I think this is very interesting is because it highlights the need for transparency, transparency in terms of how the blocks are implemented, how long they're implemented for, whether these blocks are actually in compliance with local laws and regulations, and more importantly, it highlights the need to have some sort of process in place which ensures that bans are, that blocks are lifted, you know, uh, in time. Um, and this is something that we haven't seen only in Indonesia. Unfortunately, we have seen this in many countries around the world where, you know, ISPs are initially, they, they receive an order from the government to block certain websites and then, you know, they, they sometimes just forget to lift the blocks. Uh, we need processes in place and we need more dialogue and discussion around this and it hasn't been happening and we really hope that uh, Unidata can support these types of discussions. Other types of sites that we found to be censored in Indonesia include LGBT sites um, and also sites that provide information on AIDS um, prevention. So the reason why I'm highlighting this here is because it's quite easy to notice when 
major platforms that we commonly use every day are blocked. It's quite easy to notice if, I don't know, WhatsApp is blocked or if Facebook is blocked, because you'll notice, right, since, since you're using it, if you're using it. Um, I don't know, I guess many of you probably heard of the Facebook outage yesterday, or not? No, okay. <laughs> Uh, there wasn't a case of blocking, but since it affected millions of people around the world um, and it was all over the news. What we don't hear about often, though, is the, when, when the sites of minority groups are blocked. Um, those cases usually go unnoticed because, let's face it, who is monitoring whether the, the sites of, uh, I don't know, gender activists is are accessible every day? Who is monitoring the accessibility of LGBT sites? Who is monitoring the accessibility of religious minority sites? <laughs> okay. Yeah, but what I'm trying to say is that these cases can go unnoticed. Um, and as long as censorship is implemented in the dark, you know, um, there is this potential for human rights abuse. Um, and so this is why we feel that it's important to use it so that we can have discussions. Uh, another interesting, uh, final interesting thing from Indonesia was that we also found an online translator to be blocked. And we also found the same online translator as long, along with others to be blocked in Iran as well. Um, why do you think an online translator would be blocked? Any ideas? Yeah? Excellent. There you go. Bingo. Yes, that, that is, yeah. So basically, if you, if you copy-paste a URL into an online translator, it will give you access to the content of the website, even if that website is blocked in your network. So ultimately, online translators, in addition to you know, community engagement and so on and all the other wonderful things they, they give us, uh, is they basically serve as a circumvention tool. And because they serve as a circumvention tool, we see them blocked in many countries around the world, uh, including Indonesia and Iran. So why do you think that the, the sites, for example, that promote sex education or uh, AIDS prevention would be blocked? Any ideas on that? Maybe. I actually don't have an answer for this. Um, there is no clear legal justification, to my knowledge at least, and having consulted with our partners, there is no clear legal justification. So one can infer that Likely, these types of sites, uh, rather than having a, a clear legal backing, um, it infers that possibly, you know, social and cultural norms, uh, you know, influence decisions around censorship as well. Uh, social and cultural norms influence laws, laws influence social and cultural norms, it goes both ways, but we ultimately see that a lot of this feeds into what is blocked. And what I'm trying to say here basically is that, you know, we can have discussions around what should be blocked, what shouldn't be blocked, and so on. And obviously censorship is not binary, it differs from country to country technically, but, it also, but also it's motiva the motivation behind it differs and the justification d differs depending on the laws and, and social and cultural norms of each country. But I really believe we need to have transparency to know what is blocked to begin with. And once we know what is blocked, then we can have this discussion on whether this is ethical, legal, or whatever. So this is a, an example of a blog page from Indonesia. Um, I wasn't sure uh, what, who would be in the audience, which is why I'm bringing this. Um, I just want to say that basically that when we say blog page, when we say censorship, often what you see is something like this. This is an example from Indonesia, and as you can see, it usually has some sort of justification at the bottom from its relevant ministry. The reason why I'm highlighting this here is because what I, want to, what I want to say is that this is a very clear case of censorship. You're trying to access a website and you can see that no, you are not allowed. Access denied, right? Or access restricted. But there are many other forms of censorship which are not so obvious, which are much more subtle. Such examples of subtle censorship can be found in Cuba. Um, earlier this year, uh, my team and I had the opportunity to travel to Cuba to perform um, network measurement testing ourselves, uh, mostly because um, there aren't that many Uniprobe users in Cuba for, I think, obvious reasons. Um, and we were fascinated and curious to see what the network looks like in the country. Um, what we noticed there was that 
Well, first of all, we were able to uh, confirm the blocking of more than 40 websites. Most of these websites had one thing in common, that directly or indirectly they expressed criticism towards Cuba's government. Um, however, it's worth noting that you know, a lot of other sites that also expressed criticism weren't blocked. So, for example, uh, in our testing, we had a Reports Without Borders uh, site uh, where uh, sorry, web page, which had basically a profile of Raul Castro um, portraying him as a predator of press freedom. You would assume that would be blocked, but it wasn't. So what I'm trying to say, is, and similarly, Amnesty International are banned from Cuba, yet their site is accessible in Cuba. So what I'm trying to say is that a lot of things you would assume to be blocked aren't, and vice versa. The interesting thing here was that it wasn't, you didn't see something like this in Cuba. Instead, when you try to access these blocked websites, um, you know, you would just get some sort of error message, which looked very similar to an, an error message you would get in many other cases where you don't have intentional blocking. Um, and the reason for this is because what they were doing was that they, the, the ISP at Texa was resetting your connection and serving you a blank block page. Um, so unless you're actually probing the network and collecting network measurement data, to the normal user, it's not clear that the site is actually being blocked by the government, right? Similarly, we found Skype to be blocked, and Skype was actually the only popular communication tool that we found to be blocked. But with Skype, again, it wasn't, it wasn't clear. Like, in the beginning, it just seemed that it just wasn't accessible because the network was very slow, you know? Like, it, it wasn't clear at all. We were only able to determine that it was, in fact, intentionally blocked once we analyzed, analyzed packets and so on, and then realized that you know, they were basically resetting the connection uh, and so on. But I, I should probably highlight here that in Cuba, um, and I, I don't think personally that internet censorship is the biggest problem, censorship-wise, because uh, self-censorship is reinforced a lot uh, due to the political climate uh, of the country. There are many cases where censorship is politically motivated, and with UNI we're collecting data, uh, thanks to our global community. Uh, this is an example from Malaysia, um, with, in regards to the 1MDB scandal. Uh, this scandal uh, basically occurred in late 2015. 1MDB is a government-run uh, strategic development company in Malaysia, and the scandal broke out when it was basically uncovered that about 700 uh, million US dollars were transferred to the personal bank account of the Prime Minister. Um, and so once the scandal came out, I, I believe the story was first released by the Washington Post, then a, a wide range of local media outlets are reporting about it and people started writing about it on their blogs and on Medium and everywhere. And what happened was that Malaysia, who up until then uh, didn't implement very noticeable censorship, started blocking all these sites that were covering the scandal. Um, I think this was a very clear case of politically motivated censorship where the government wanted to, you know, hide the corruption involved. Um, and obviously this had a, a, a bigger impact because since one of the posts covering that, the story were on Medium, it blocked the whole of Medium. So that also affected all the other blogs hosted on Medium, not just the ones related to the scandal. Another case of politically motivated censorship occurred in Uganda last year during their general elections. Um, what we can see here basically is the blocking of social media on the day of elections, but also um, on, during the integration of the president. Uh, the reason why I've included this table here is because what you can see is a comparison of the blocking between two uh, local ISPs. And what you can see here is that um, while Smell Telecom blocked the HTTP and HTTPS version of Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, and Viber, thus making it pretty hard to circumvent the censorship unless you're using a circumvention tool, uh, Orange, on the other hand, only blocked the HTTP version of Facebook and Twitter. Um, we think that maybe the reason why they did this is because likely ISPs in Uganda received a very vague order from the government saying, block social media, without specifying, okay, what do they mean by social media? Like, which sites, which tools? Um, do they only want the HTTP or do they want the HTTPS version as well? And because they gave this, you know, vague order, it was then in the discretion of the ISPs to implement as much blocking they want to. And so in the case of Orange, what you can see is that Ugandans could very easily circumvent the censorship by merely accessing Facebook and Twitter over HTTPS. 
In Ethiopia, um, there were a lot of political protests, uh, which started in late 2015. Um, they lasted for more than six months, and then the country was in a state of emergency. Uh, these political protests were very deadly. More than 900 people were murdered. And these protests were basically waged by ethnic, uh, by ethnic groups in the country who were protesting against their persecution and marginalization by uh, Ethiopian authorities. Um, during this very chaotic time, um, somehow UNIPROB was run in the country. And based on the data that was collected, uh, we were able to collect evidence that WhatsApp was blocked. Um, practically, this I, we think was somewhat a problem, given that you know, in the middle of political of political protests, in the middle of all of this chaos, uh, people actually couldn't use one of the most popular tools to communicate. Uh, we also uncovered the presence of DPI, which was used to block access to more than 15 major Ethiopian news websites. Um, so the reason why I'm emphasizing that they're Ethiopian is because we see that it's not only the case that ISPs are blocking foreign media, they're also sometimes blocking local media when they're reporting on news that, you know, they don't want to be covered. Um, we also found them to be blocking uh, the sites of the political opposition um, and also numerous uh, circumvention tools. Uh, we published a very comprehensive, uh, well, a long report on this in collaboration with Amnesty International which you can find through the link below, um, and I encourage you to read. Similarly, in all the previous slides, I also included links where you can read more and learn more. Um, during these protests in Ethiopia, though, something happened. Um, in August of 2016, uh, during a brief period when the, the, the protests really intensified, we, saw, we, we heard rumors from the locals that the internet was completely inaccessible that there was blackout, basically. It was shut down completely. Now, Uniprobe is not designed in its current form to measure blackouts, because in order for Uniprobe to perform tests, it needs to connect to a network. And if there is no internet, there's nothing to connect to, and therefore, there's, you know. And so what we did in this case is that we refer to third-party data sources to investigate further. Uh, this graph here is uh, data uh, which is collected and published by Google. Um, it basically shows Google traffic uh, to a lot of its major pro um, products. In this case, it's traffic uh, to Google search. And what you can see here is that while there was normal traffic, suddenly in those dates, uh, 7th and 8th of August, uh, there was suddenly no traffic, and then the traffic came back. This indicates that likely there was a complete shutdown. Then we cross-correlated this information with other publicly da available da uh, data sources, such as uh, BGP announcement data, data collected from RIPE, and so on, and we're able to confirm uh, from all these different data sets that, in fact, there appears to have been a complete blackout, where, you know, instead of targeting specific tools and, and resources, there was just no internet. We saw a very similar scenario also in the Gambia. Uh, on the day of its presidential election on the 1st of December last year. Um, as you can see in this graph again, uh, there's a very clear disruption on the 1st of December, no internet. Again, if you cross-correlate this with BGP announcement data and so on, you will see that the prefixes are in mass withdrawn on that day, all indicating that there was no internet. Um, possibly in an attempt to uh, prevent people from protesting on the election day, possibly in an attempt to prevent the opposition from uh, carrying out its campaigns on social media, which is a very popular strategy. And many of you may think that, oh, all these cases are in Africa and Asia, and they have nothing to do with us in Europe. It's all irrelevant to us. Well, actually, very recently, uh, we saw some sense of events in, in Catalonia, here in Europe. Um, many of, um, are you familiar with this case? Raise hands. Okay, great. So essentially, um, what happened was that uh, websites that were related to the Catalan independence referendum were seized. And then after they were seized, um, some locals in Catalonia mirrored those sites. Uh, and then they started to notice that the mirrored sites started to get blocked. Um, measurements were run on the ground. Um, in Catalonia, but also throughout Spain. And the data that we collect, based on the data that we collected, we were able to confirm that at least 25 sites re directly related to the Catalan referendum were blocked by DNS tampering or HTTP blocking, um, different techniques by different ISPs. Um, so, again, with, with all these cases, 
we can, we can start to argue that, oh, maybe the censorship is legally justified or not, but what we're trying to say is that with Uniprobe, you can basically collect the data which shows you what is happening, and then based on that data, you can then have your debate on whether that is legally justifiable, ethical, or not. So, how to run Uniprobe? Uh, Uniprobe is available for various platforms, as you can see. Uh, it's also available for on F-Droid, um, which you, you might uh, prefer. Um, specifically, on desktop, it's currently available uh, for Linux and Mac, uh, Android, iOS, and mobile, and it's, we also have a distribution for Raspberry Pis. Um, I should probably note that um, we're, we've just started working on desktop apps. Uh, which will be uh, hopefully as easy to install and run as any other software. Uh, and these apps are going to be for Windows and Mac primarily, but I think we're also going to have one for, for Linux. Um, and there's various trade-offs depending on uh, the platform that you use or benefits. So this is the Uniprobe web UI. <clears throat> so if you install uh, Uniprobe on your Linux or on your Mac, uh, basically you will get this. And then through here, through this web interface, you can directly uh, choose which test you want to run and run it directly. And you can also you know, see the results, the measurements, the data directly in this web platform. Um, here where we say, for example, test the web and so on, uh, or test and submissioning apps, if you click on that, you will, also, you will see basically that actually includes multiple tests, not just one. So each one of those is basically a deck for multiple tests. The, the plus side of running it this way is basically that um, all, of, all of the Uniprobe tests, especially the core ones, are integrated in here, so you have a lot more variety in options. Alternatively, you may run, want to run Uniprobe on your Raspberry Pi. Uh, we have a distribution for that. Um, some of our partners prefer this option, um, especially those who, uh, human rights advocates who are interested in running Uniprobe but don't feel very comfortable with the command line. Um, which is required to access the web UI previously. In this case, uh, you just burn, it on, burn the image on SD card, you put it into the Raspberry Pi, plug it in, and it will automatically run the test for you every day uh, and send the measurements and so on. So this is a, a, you know, a preferred option for those who don't feel comfortable with the command line. And we also have mobile apps, as mentioned. Uh, so the mobile apps, um, basically the easiest way I think for sure, to run Uniprobe is through the mobile apps. Um, it's super easy to install. The, the plus side is that, in addition to being easy, it also includes uh, the speed and performance tests. So it has the NDT test for measuring the speed and performance of your network. It also has the dash test for measuring uh, video streaming performance. On the downside, though, it doesn't currently include all of the Uniprobe tests. Um, however, in the next release that we'll be making by the end of the month, it will also include the missing instant messaging apps uh, messaging, so the missing messaging app tests will also be in integrated. Uh, and then we have plans to integrate Tor tests as well in the future. UniRun is a recent release that we're super excited about because uh, this basically allows us to, or enables us, to coordinate better to fight censorship together around the planet. What we mean by this is that, so to access this, you just go to run.un.io. Um, preferably, you have the mobile app installed. If you don't, no worries, it will tell you to do that in the next steps. But as you can see here, you can add the URLs the, that you want to test directly in there. Um, and then you click generate, and then it has a link. And then, uh, you know, you can basically test those URLs directly in your mobile app, or you can share that link with your friends or contacts anywhere around the world. So if you have heard that a specific website is blocked in a country during an election or during some other political event, or you're suspecting that it may have been, and you want to collect data to learn more, you can just add that site here, generate a link, share that with people in that country through social media, through email, through whatever it is you want to share it with them. And then by clicking on that, it will prompt them to install the app and it will automatically start testing the websites. So what we can essentially do is that we can build a global network where we all coordinate to measure censorship together. And as you can see, it also includes other tests that you may be interested in. 
Also, once you click on the Generate button, uh, it also has the option where, depending on what you want to test, uh, it will give you some code that you can embed in your website if you're interested in having the accessibility of your website monitored by Uniprobe users around the world. Um, so by embedding the widget in your site, um, you know, you can then, Uniprobe users will then be able to test your site on an ongoing basis and you'll be able to know where your site is blocked around the world. However, um, there are some potential risks in the sense that um, Uniprobe is not a privacy tool. It is a tool for investigations because of its nature. It is designed to measure a network to detect censorship. Therefore, there may be some potential risks as communicated to us by lawyers. Um, however, I should probably flag that to our knowledge, um, no one has ever gone into trouble as a result of running Uniprobe. So all of the risks that we detail uh, in a lot of detail in the risks documentation in the link below, uh, are actually quite theoretical and speculative. Nonetheless, we, we feel that it's important that you are aware of at least three basic things. The first one is that when you run Uniprobe, anyone who is monitoring your internet activity, such as your, your government, your ISP, or your employer, or whoever, they will be able to see that you are running Uniprobe. It's not hidden in any way. And actually, it's not possible to, to our knowledge at least, um, it's, it's, it's not really possible to make it hidden because if you do it over a circumvention tool, then you're not actually measuring your local network. You're measuring something else, right? Um, however, you know, I mean, the fact that they're mon the fact that they will know that you're running Uniprobe is also true for all the other software that you're running on your computer. It's no different, right? But for some users in some high-risk environments, this could potentially be a concern. That is why we feel that the more people are measuring their networks, the less risk is involved. Because one thing, if you're the only user in Congo, and it's a different thing if there's tens of thousands of people running the software. The other thing is that the types of uh, URLs that you will test may include uh, you know, more uh, provocative or ob objectionable contents, in the sense like pornography, for example. Um, the, main, the, the default way of running Uniprobe is that it will, it will test a list of websites, and these websites are very diverse in their nature. But they also include things like pornography, hate speech, gambling, and so on. The reason why we include these more provocative slash illegal forms of content in there is because simply they're more likely to be blocked. And because they're more likely to be blocked, this enables us to see how the specific ISP is blocking content in that network, which will then feed into our heuristics for data analysis and understanding censorship in the country and detecting censorship elsewhere for other sites, right? Um, the other thing that you should also know is that unless you opt out, the default is that all network measurement data uh, is automatically collected by Uni and published. Um, the reason why we, we publish all data is because we want to increase transparency of internet censorship. However, there is, in theory, the, the risk that this could potentially be linked back to you. Probably not directly, I should emphasize, because we do not collect IP addresses, we do not collect personally identifiable information, we do not collect PCAPs, we only collect the data that's absolutely necessary for determining censorship. However, uh, a very motivated ISP uh, you know, could potentially go to the data, compare that with their logs, and somehow try to track it back to you. But again, this depends on your threat model and depends on the resources that the ISP has available. However, there are various choices you can make to minimize, to reduce this potential risk involved. Um, for starters, uh, it, it really depends on which Uniprobe tests you run. As I mentioned, there are many tests. Not all the, all the tests carry the same potential risk. For example, if you run the, the Uni WhatsApp test, what you are doing basically is that you are connecting to WhatsApp endpoints. A billion people connect to WhatsApp endpoints every day. Um, so there's no real risk in that, right? However, if you, on the other hand, run the web connectivity test and then you start connecting to pornography, pornographic sites in a country where pornography is illegal, then maybe there is some risk there. So what I'm trying to say, it really depends on which tests you run. The other thing is that it also depends on what you're actually testing. Um, so we have these things called test lists, which are basically lists of URLs that we collect uh, for each country around the world uh, and that we test for censorship. Uh, 
these Teslas are maintained by the Citizen Lab and they provide this, this uh, resource on GitHub for us, but also for other censorship measurement projects around the world. So what you can do uh, is that you can contribute to these Teslas to determine what gets tested. If you feel that there are URLs in there that shouldn't be there, that you feel absolutely uncomfortable with, you can make that case on GitHub and you, know, you can suggest to remove those URLs. Or you can propose other URLs that you think should be tested and currently aren't being tested. Because we're not testing every single website on the internet. There are bandwidth constraints we need to take into consideration. Uh, rather, we are, we are testing curated sets of lists of URLs. The other thing you can do uh, is configure your settings. Um, so the default way is that when you run Uniprobe, the measurement data is uploaded to our servers and then published. Uh, the default is that it is upload to, uploaded to our servers with Tor Hidden Services. And this is actually the recommended way so that we don't know where exactly the data is coming from. But you know, alternatively, you can upload the data with um, HTTPS collectors or with cloud fronting. We support both. There are pluses. You know, there are various trade-offs there. If you don't feel that, if your threat model is that you know, there is no risk in running Uniprobe in Norway, for example, and you want to optimize for submitting results as fast as possible, then maybe you want to use HTTPS collectors. But if you're running it, say, in Iran or somewhere else, then maybe you want to go with the default, which is store hidden services. So, or maybe in a country, or maybe you don't want it to be known that you are using Tor to begin with. Uh, so, because maybe in your country, you know, that in itself is not viewed very favorably. So maybe instead, what you want to use is cloud fronting, where instead it looks like you're connecting to Amazon, but actually you're connecting to our servers. Um, so, depending on your threat model, depending on what you feel comfortable with, there are various choices you can make. Um, and uh, again, so in the settings. What, what data do we collect? As I mentioned, we only collect the data that is necessary for determining censorship. So this includes uh, your ASN. Um, and the reason for this is because, you know, in order for us to be able to say that Vodafone is blocking whatnot in X country, uh, you know, we need to know the ASN number. We need to know who is implementing the censorship. The other thing we collect is the country code so that we know in which country the censorship is happening, obviously. The other thing we collect is the date and the time of the measurements so that we know when it occurred. And then, depending on the test that you run, different network measurement data is collected. But again, we, because Uni, Uni has been a community-driven project since the very beginning, our software has been designed with volunteers and their privacy and security in mind. And while it's not a privacy tool, we do make choices in terms of tests that we have based on their security. Um, and then, again, depending on the platform, there are various trade-offs there. So based on these things, there are various choices you can make depending on your threat model, depending on what you feel comfortable with, to run Uniprobe in a way that makes sense for you. As I mentioned, test lists are lists of URLs that we test for censorship. Uh, there are two types of test lists. There is the global test list, which includes internationally relevant websites. Um, so for example, things like Facebook.com, Twitter.com would be in the global list. Uh, whereas country-specific lists are uh, lists of URLs that are specific to each country, which rather include like local news websites, local human rights sites, and so on. Um, and here I link basically to a sort of guide where you can find information on how to contribute to these test lists, and also the GitHub repo. The reason why we publish all data that we collect um, is because we aim to increase transparency of internet censorship. Uh, and we also aim to provide the public with evidence of censorship. The evidence part, the reason why we say evidence is because the data, the, the data clearly shows you like, what is happening in the network, who is blocking what, with which technique, and so on. That's why we're saying that it is evidence. It's, it's very hard to disprove that. And this type of information, we feel, can be very valuable, potentially, to lawyers. Lawyers who are interested in using such data as evidence in court cases. Journalists, journalists who are interested in using such data for evidence-based reporting. Um, you know, they, they can go through the data and uncover censorship events before other people do and be the first to report on them and have data which proves them. Uh, also, human rights activists and human rights advocates can tailor their campaigns uh, and, and, you know, uh, use the data as evidence as part of their campaigns. And circumvention tool projects can also tailor the development of their tools and their strategies and their outreach efforts with a knowledge of what has been blocked around the world and how and so on. 
Um, and then from a research perspective, we feel that there are a lot of very interesting and fascinating questions that can be asked and answered through the data. Um, by publishing all the data, you know, you can verify our findings because we don't claim to be God, we don't claim to be like the, the nodal of censorship or whatever. Rather, we're giving you the data so that you can tell us what we're doing wrong, how we can improve our methodology, and so that you can use it as part of your work and as part of your research. And maybe even ask questions that we haven't even thought of. That would be fantastic. So where can you find the data? There are two places you can find the data. Um, the one place is Uni Explorer. This is an interactive um, data map, as you can see. By clicking on each country, you will find all of the network measurements that have ever been collected for each country. Um, and here, I should flag that we aim to revamp this completely uh, we, over the next year, uh, and we probably will get rid of the map because it's a bit misleading, because there's a lot of red on the eastern part of the world, but actually um, that's only because we, it's easier to detect censorship there. <laughs> but, you know, the data is there, you can go through it and find information and so on. Um, here's an example from Norway. Uh, when you click on Norway, this is what you get. As you can see from the 1,105 and so URLs that are tested every day, um, only one website is found to be blocked, um, and that's a torrenting site. Um, and you can argue that, oh, what's the point of you know, engaging in this research in countries like Norway where there clearly is not much censorship or it's legally justified or whatever? Well, the thing is, you can't really go back in time and wish you had run measurements when censorship knocks on your door, right? Like when suddenly something gets blocked, you can't wish that, oh, I wish I had run Uniprobe yesterday so I could have data as evidence. No, you can't do that. But what you can do is be prepared and run it every day on a daily basis as citizens of the world to hold RSPs and our governments to account on a daily basis. And when and if they decide to implement censorship, we will be there and we'll be watching and we'll have the data. And the other thing is also that, you know, um, a lot of a lot of types of censorship um, are subtle, and so we want to keep an eye out for this. Another place where you can find the data is through our uh, API. It's an open API. Um, all the data is in there. We include uh, documentation, which explains how you can query the data, um, specifically how you can query to find all the blocked websites in your country. Um, and this is this is a probably more useful also for data, data scientists who are interested in joining the community. And before, like in the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that you know, we aim to be a decentralized project. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is that we encourage you to analyze the data, to dig through the data, to find cases of censorship, which we're probably sitting on, but haven't noticed. Uh, it's a lot of data in there. And we are constantly improving our data analysis techniques and our pipeline and so on, but you know, there's always space for more help and uh, more research. And it also depends on what questions you're asking. Um, so we encourage you all to join the Uni Data Analyst community uh, to dig through the data and find censorship. The somewhat tricky part can be interpreting the data. So in general, the way that we have uh, the data kind of analyzed in uh, Uni Explorer, but also in the API and so on, is that we generally think of the measurements in terms of normal and anomalous. A normal measurement, obviously, is a measurement where everything is okay, where there are no signs of censorship. Um, an anomalous measurement is one where there are si there's a sign of censorship, but it doesn't necessarily contain evidence of censorship. Um, because sometimes, for example, you know, we have false positives. False positives can occur, for example, if, uh, you know, uh, the, the content of a website differs depending on your geographic location, or where ISP serve different content depending on uh, you know, where you're accessing it from. Or it can happen, for example, if there's, a, if there's a captcha. There are many reasons why different false positives can occur. And so usually what we do is that we do a lot of data analysis on top of the initial processing to determine whether something is in fact blocked or not across time. The only case where we're able to confirm a case of censorship with 100% accuracy is when there's a block page, because, yeah, I mean, they're telling us themselves that it's blocked, it's obvious. But in the cases where there isn't a block page, then we analyze the data over time 
to see how many times it's failing persistently across time and so on. And we often also uh, examine the accessibility of the site from other vantage points as well, because it may be the case that the site, uh, you know, it's not that the site is blocked by the local ISP, but maybe that it has high global failure rates, or maybe the site itself is blocking access. So there's a lot of other additional data analysis that has to happen on top of that. So how can you get involved? Um, well, you can join the UNI community by measuring your networks and holding your local ISPs to account and collecting the data so we can know what's happening on the internet. You can contribute a test list because, you know, the censorship findings are only as interesting as what you're testing. So, you know, we may think that there's no censorship in Norway, but maybe that's because we're not testing the sites that are actually blocked for example, right? So it was important to constantly review and update test lists. Of course, data analysis, as mentioned, join the UNI data analyst community and tell stories based on the data. That is the most important part. And if you're interested in engaging others, of course, feel encouraged to host an UNI workshop of your own. And for those who are interested in a more formal collaboration, we also have uh, the UNI partnership program through which we collaborate with digital rights organizations around the world on the study and investigation of internet censorship. Uh, if you're interested in collaborating with us on that and joining forces, please do get in touch. Um, and here are some resources that you might find handy. I hope you all go away and we leave and you feel encouraged to join us in this fight. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, um, uh, thank you, Maria. Um, I, have to, I have to admit um, I was a little bit biased, giving you more time. Um, uh, but I think you've talked about um, very important aspects, and uh, especially advocating for a decentralized system, which is critical. So right now, um, very quick um, um, questions. One. Two, right. Um, Maria, I want to thank you for an excellent talk. And I, I say this because most of the questions I had during the talk were answered. So it really worked well. Uh, yet I still have two very short ones. One is a bit silly. Um, like, what's your favorite censorship of them all. Maybe because it's it's silly or it's brutal or it's uh, just absurd. Um, and the other one is, have you ever had the case or are you thinking about it that some censorship would be so elaborate, maybe using DPI every, everywhere, that when an Uniprobe be detected, that computer be served with something else, either access to everything or access to nothing to say, fuck you Uni, as it happened before. So the second case hasn't happened to my knowledge. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think we've come across that sophisticated censorship. I think, as I mentioned before, the, probably one of the most interesting cases of sophisticated censorship were the cases in Iran, um, where basically they block and unblock things to create uncertainty, potentially. Um, and yeah, and also where they basically block the same uh, resources in different ways, the same ISP. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think I'm familiar with a case where they've intentionally tried to fight back. Uh, maybe there is a case like that in the data, but I don't recall one right now. Um, and in terms of my personal favorite, I'm, this is the irony of working in this field, that you, know, you get excited when you find censorship, but it's actually not a very exciting thing. It's a depressing thing. <laughs> um, I find amusing cases where we find censorship that make no sense. So for example, um, one amusing case was in Indonesia where we found PETA.XXX to be blocked. Uh, PETA is like the worldwide animal rights organization. And then when I saw that, I was like, whoa, why are they blocking an animal rights site? Like, this makes no sense. And they weren't blocking like a PETA.com or PETA.org or whatever the canonical one is. So then I was like, oh, they think this is pornography because of the XXX. So, you know, they have like the law, which is telling them block pornography, but ultimately they're blocking an animal rights site. I don't know, like things, small things like that are, I think, quite funny. Um, but then, I guess, um, other interesting cases are, uh, but not so funny, not funny at all actually, but other interesting cases are when we see that minority group sites are blocked. Um, uh, in various countries, like the cases that I mentioned in Iran and so on. Because I feel that 
uh, minority groups are, a lot, a lot of minority groups kind of live um, in the shadow in a lot of countries um, in, from a lot of perspectives uh, because their rights are violated, the mainstream public often doesn't care and so on. And then seeing their sites also being blocked is kind of the chair and the cake in the most negative sense possible because you see that they don't have a voice also in the online world and that a lot of the prejudice and the bias and the abuse is been transferred from the offline world to the online world, and I feel that's really horrible. Um, so those cases I find very concerning. And then when there are cases of where it's very clear that censorship is politically motivated, it's like, ha, that's why you're doing it. So it depends. Yeah, thank you, Murray. Hi, my name is Berge. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I tried only probe hair now and. Uh, it seemed to work, but uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, there were two uh, false positives, I think. But anyway, um, my question is, uh, I work with a digital uh, politics uh, part of the Green Party here in Norway, and we have a quite a strict line against uh, online censorship uh, in our um, program, uh, but uh, not 100%. And I, I struggle with this question. I, I wonder about this question, if there is ever anything that is, uh, should be, be blocked. And I lean against, uh, I lean towards maybe thinking that nothing ever should be blocked online and if there is something really heinous, like uh, uh, rape against children and stuff like that, that we should not block it but rather send the police force to try and get those people. But I wonder uh, what you think about this. Is there ever anything that should be blocked or, yeah, thank you. That, that's a fascinating question um, and a very important one, actually, that I wonder a lot, actually. Um, it's, hard, it's hard to say that I think that there should be absolutely no censorship because, to be honest, I feel comfortable and actually I think it's a good thing, for example, to block child pornography. Um, there, so what I'm trying to say is that there are certain sites which I don't mind or I even feel happy for them to not be that accessible. But then the... The problem is, though, that where do you draw a line? Um, as Uni, generally, what we, we're trying to refrain as much as possible from taking a position on whether certain censorship is good or bad. Rather, our aim is to provide data to the public uh, and to enable the public to have these discussions for themselves. Um, because obviously, whether censorship is good or bad, justifiable or not, I mean, that, the answer to that question varies from country to country, sometimes even from region to region within countries, um, because every country has different laws, different social norms, different cultural norms. You need to respect cultural norms. So on the one hand, you may feel that, I don't know, a, a specific country, you, the, the, the issue with censorship is that a lot of con information is, the, the way we consume information is very subjective, right? So I may consider, certain information to be blasphemous, or I may consider it to be horrible. Maybe someone, uh, someone else doesn't. Maybe someone else considers that to be free, you know, free expression. Um, it's very debatable. Information and how we interpret information is very debatable uh, and very subjective, depending on the background of the person who's looking at the information. Um, so if we are in a position where we start making rules for what should be blocked or what shouldn't be blocked, those rules are, again, guided by our biases, our social um, background, our privileges, our cultural background, you know? And then where do you draw the line? Because based on the same logic, we see Muslim countries, uh, for example, blocking um, a lot of non-Islamic, a lot of religious sites that are non, not related to Islam. And you may argue that, oh, why are they doing? That is suppressing religious expression. But from their perspective, that makes sense, maybe. Um, because maybe the content of those sites is considered blasphemous. So what I'm trying to say is that it's, it's very hard to say, and I don't, I don't think that we should ever reach a point where we, we can say with absolute certainty what the rules of good or bad information should be. Because if we reach that point, we're kind of doomed in the sense that we should always be rethinking uh, and we should always be we should always be reconsidering what we take for granted. We should always be questioning. We should always be considering all the possible angles. And once you start putting rules for censorship, you lose all of that. And that's also how you lose progress, progress of mind, progress of, of thought. So we need to you know, provide a space where um, we are able to examine all these different types of information and 
from our perspective, we leave it up to countries to determine what they consider to be good or bad and so on based on their norms. Um, but if the information is public, you know, there can always be those voices, maybe minority voices, who may say, you know what, I actually think that this should not be blocked for X, Y, Z reason. But you can't even have the discussion if it's not transparent what is blocked to begin with. Sorry? I, I, what I just explained, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, one more. Yep. Yep. It's, it's more a commentary on that last, which is just straightforwardly that if a government is, has, has put in place censorship because of some justification it's using and it is using it to censor something else, it is vitally important that that be something that is exposed because they're breaking their own rule. And that, in the end, is the we don't care what rules you claim are just and right and proper for censorship. If you're breaking them, we're going to make sure everybody knows. So thank you for doing that. Thanks. I'm glad you highlighted that actually, because yeah, that was spot on. Um, regardless of yeah, in, in many in many countries, in most countries actually, well, let's just say many. In many countries, there are official block lists, like lists of websites that you know ISPs are you know, have to block. But sometimes we see that they also block other websites which are not on the official block list. So you know, have, having that transparency of what is actually blocked is it in fact only the sites that are on the block list, but is it also other sites? Uh, we need to be monitoring that. And uh, by we, I don't mean us, uni, I mean us, the planet, us, the citizens of the world. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Please do get in touch if you have any questions uh, or if you'd like to discuss further. Um, always happy to engage with you. Right, and um, uh, so we come to um, the end of our program today, and I want to thank you guys for being patient, for, be, for being interactive. That is important. I mean, from the beginning of the program, we've been through resilient um, uh, uh, cryptocurrency meets uh, universal basic income, the road to um, uh, open village, and of course, some... Um, last but not least, um, love against the machine from um, Jeremy. Um, so I think um, it has been a um, fantastic day. So um, tomorrow will be even more interesting. So um, right now, um, uh, I hope that you enjoy the evening. And uh, I look forward to like, meeting you guys in the party. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Yep.